Hello and welcome to the second lecture in my new series entitled Understanding Science. You may already have seen the first lecture in this series on the subject of proof. If you haven't, then I suggest you go back and watch it before you watch this lecture, as they are designed to be seen in order. Each lecture will build on knowledge from earlier lectures, so you may not get the most out of this lecture if you watch it without the foundation that I built up in lecture 1. In this second lecture I'm going to talk about Bayes' theorem, which is one of the most important concepts underlying the whole practice of science. Bayes' theorem tells us what it means to build up a body of knowledge, and how we can bring in empirical evidence to support or disprove our scientific theories. I'm hoping that my first lecture will have generated a few questions about the nature of science, and possibly quite a few disagreements. Today's lecture should bring together a few of those threads that I left dangling unanswered last time, but I just wanted to clear up a few things before I get started on today's topic of Bayes' theorem. To recap what we spoke about in lecture 1, I think there were four main takeaway points that are important to understand. Firstly, I spoke about the three main assumptions that we have to make in order to make any progress in science, or any method of knowledge discovery. If you recall, those were a. We need to assume that there are some underlying laws to the universe that we are able to examine. b. We need to assume that our senses are telling us something that is accurate about the world around us. And c. We have to use some system of parsimony, such as Occam's razor, in order to justify exactly how we will encode our scientific discoveries into usable knowledge. Secondly, I pointed out that scientific theories are very rarely, or if you are being pedantic, never, able to tell us what is absolutely 100% true or false. Partly this is because of the assumptions that I mentioned earlier, but mainly this is because we have to make generalisations given the evidence that we've managed to gather in support of our theories, and that evidence is always incomplete. For example, it may seem like Isaac Newton gathered ample evidence to support his famous laws of motion. Those laws formed the basis for the entire subject of classical physics. But what Newton didn't know is that the laws break down once we start moving at very high speeds, close to the speed of light. It's not that his observations were wrong, but merely that they didn't cover enough of the potential space of variables. And if you'd asked him, it's highly unlikely that he would ever have suggested that travelling at high speed might alter the way in which his simple laws behaved. So although Newton's laws were shown to be correct by a staggering number of tests, they were still proved wrong eventually. Does that mean that they're to be discarded? Well, no, and I'll come back to this point on the next slide. Thirdly, we encounter the spectrum of certainty. If you remember, this is a line with absolutely 100% false statements at one end, and absolutely 100% true statements at the other. Science, I claimed, is the process of determining at which end of the line all statements about the universe should lie. However, in practice, scientific claims are rarely or never proved or disproved with 100% certainty. So in reality, science consists of moving our theories along this spectrum of certainty, towards either one end or the other, as more and more evidence arrives. Fourthly, and finally, we learned about scientific theories. A theory is a model of the universe, together with a large amount of supporting evidence. Theories should be robust, they should make predictions, and they should be potentially falsifiable. That is, it must be possible to make tests of the predictions that a theory produces, and if the tests fail, then the theory must be discarded or rewritten. So that's a brief recap. Let's also just answer a few questions that have arisen since last time. There are a few issues that are worth considering around these four points, and most importantly around the concept of true and false. I think the first one I'd like to make is that false does not imply completely and utterly incorrect. So, for example, if I asked you what 7 times 4 was equal to, and you said 26 instead of 28, then you would be wrong, but not nearly as wrong as the person who said that 7 times 4 is 158 million, or the person who said that 7 times 4 is Papua New Guinea. Similarly, one could look at a theory such as Newton's laws of motion and say that they were wrong. And they were wrong, because they failed to take into account relativistic effects that are never equal to zero, even at low speeds. OK, they're amazingly tiny and undetectable effects at most speeds, but strictly speaking, they're still there. But to say that Newton was wrong is a bit cruel. After all, the law he built has remained at the core of physics and is used perfectly well even today to describe situations in which relativistic effects are negligible. So he was correct in a specific area of applications. It's just that he wasn't able to predict the limitations of the applicability of his own theory. Similarly, primitive human civilizations used to believe that the Earth was flat. And they were obviously wrong. But how wrong were they? After all, the Earth is locally flat. If you take any... 20 by 20 kilometer square of the Earth's surface, then it's pretty flat. In fact, you could make some accurate artillery calculations based on that assumption. And is that a different category of wrong to when Newton said that all objects always behave according to his laws? Well, perhaps it is and perhaps it isn't, but they're both right for a limited range of applications. Either way, a few thousand years ago it was noticed that the Earth was not flat, 
but was actually a sphere. In fact, it was assumed that the Earth was a perfect sphere because, well, it fitted in nicely with the prevailing mystical attitudes to the geometry of the universe that had been held since the time of the ancient Greeks. Also, nobody had a good reason to doubt it. But thanks to modern satellite technology, we now know to extraordinary precision exactly what shape the Earth is, and it's not quite spherical. It's slightly squashed between the poles. So the spherical Earthers were also wrong. But were they as wrong as the flat Earthers? I don't think so. I would say that they were much closer to the truth. So although they weren't absolutely correct either, the model of a spherical Earth was accurate for a much wider range of potential predictions than was the flat Earth model. And I put this criterion forward as a measure of accuracy. What fraction of all possible predictions made by the model pass empirical testing? The more accurate the model, the greater this fraction should be. Next, it has been claimed that some scientific claims are in fact provable or disprovable, despite what I said. Well, there's a fine line here. Let's take the claim that Carl Sagan introduced in his wonderful book, The Demon Haunted World. Truly vital reading for any budding scientist, and I suggest you pick up a copy immediately. Sagan introduces the concept like this. A fire-breathing dragon lives in my garage. Suppose I seriously make such an assertion to you. Surely you'd want to check it out, see for yourself. There have been innumerable stories of dragons over the centuries, but no real evidence. What an opportunity. Show me, you say. I lead you to my garage. You look inside, and you see a ladder, empty paint cans, an old tricycle, but no dragon. Where's the dragon, you ask? Oh, she's right here, I reply, waving vaguely. I neglected to mention that she's an invisible dragon. You propose spreading flour on the floor of the garage to capture the dragon's footprints. Good idea, I say, but this dragon floats in the air. Then you'll use an infrared sensor to detect the invisible fire. Good idea, but the invisible fire is also heatless. You'll spray paint the dragon and make her visible. Good idea, but she's an incorporeal dragon and the paint won't stick. And so on. I counter every physical test you propose with a special explanation of why it won't work. Sagan's point is well made. One can always find excuses for why empirical tests might disagree with predictions, and it's possible to come up with arguments that rescue any claim from the abyss of absolute falsehood. That doesn't mean that those claims are therefore still rational or founded on good science. In most cases, they are not. But it's fair to say that the dragon that Sagan describes here has definitely not been disproved. So maybe you might say that the specific claim of a visible, hot, fire-breathing, non-flying, corporeal dragon probably has been disproved. And here I think we're just splitting hairs. And if you want to claim that this is absolutely disproved by looking at the evidence, then I think I'm on your side. Though most philosophers probably aren't, but I think we can ignore them for now. But here I think we need to look at the quality of a scientific claim, the breadth of its predictive power. I think there's a huge void between something like the claim of a specific kind of dragon existing at a specific location, and predictive laws such as the law of gravity, which predicts how any object of any size will behave at any point in space or time. And the main difference is one of generality. The claim about dragons in garages is incredibly specific. As we make our claims more and more specific, we're able to say with greater and greater certainty whether or not they are true, but they also become less and less useful as predictive tools. Just because we may have shown that there is indeed no large, visible, corporeal, hot-fire-breathing dragon in Sagan's garage, that tells us nothing about other kinds of dragons, nor about other garages, or any other location that are not garages, etc, etc. So I think it's fair to say that the more useful a scientific theory, and by that I mean the more predictions it makes about our universe, the harder it is to shift it towards anything vaguely like certainty. So I think that's enough of a recap. Let's move on and look at today's topic of Bayes' theorem. The topic of today's lecture is one that most scientists never really learn about until they study science properly at university, and even then it's often skipped over as a curiosity, despite the fact that Bayes' theorem is of fundamental importance to the entire scientific process. In short, Bayes' theorem explains how we can gather together pieces of evidence and use that evidence to make judgments about the likelihood of scientific claims. It formalises some incredibly intuitive things about gathering knowledge, but it also tells us some highly counterintuitive things about decision making and how human intuition is often incredibly inaccurate when it comes to examining unfamiliar types of claims. So what sort of things does Bayes' theorem specifically allow us to do in the process of science? Well, it tells us what effect a new piece of evidence should have on our opinion of a scientific claim. In other words, Bayes' theorem tells us where to place a theory on the spectrum of certainty, given any new information about it. But most importantly, it also takes into account all the previous information that we've gathered so far. This is the difference between real science and evidence-based investigation. Let me give you an example, which is bizarrely enough taken from my PhD thesis. 
Let's say you're walking down the street one day, minding your own business, when you see someone who looks exactly like Elvis Presley. Now, this guy has the sequin jumpsuit, the slick back hair, the flared trousers, the walk, the mannerisms, the voice, everything. Based on the evidence that you've been presented with there and then, you should probably conclude that you're in the presence of the king of rock and roll. An evidence-based method would tell you that this was a logical conclusion to draw. However, a scientific method would take into account all of the prior evidence too such as the known fact that Elvis Presley died in 1977. And when you take that into account, the picture changes quite considerably, and you have to conclude that the man standing before you isn't quite who he seems to be. That's the difference between a purely evidence-based investigation and a science-based one, and Bayes' theorem makes this possible. Finally, Bayes' theorem allows us to work out how much confidence we should have in any theory, depending on how much evidence we've managed to collect. It shows us what effect new evidence should have on our perception of the truth or falsehood of anything we want. And this means that it can also tell us how much new evidence needs to come in, and of what nature, in order to move a theory from almost certainly true back into the zone of doubt, or even into almost certainly false. Scientists rarely talk about facts, but in the way they speak they tend to speak of most core theories as if they were 100% true. The main reason why they can do that is because they understand what the cumulative effect of decades of corroborating evidence actually is, and they know what nature of evidence would be required to shake their confidence in any theory. In the case of the really core scientific theories like gravity and evolution, I could conceive of evidence that might throw some doubt on some aspects of the theories, like Einstein's findings did to Newton's laws of motion for example, but I find it very difficult indeed to imagine the magnitude of evidence that would be required to topple these theories entirely. Carl Sagan coined the phrase, borrowed from Hume and Laplace, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. That's merely a simple conclusion drawn from an understanding of Bayes' theorem, and we'll learn where it comes from later. This idea is core to the concept of scientific scepticism. That is, the process of approaching claims, especially those which seem to go against long-established laws, with a healthy degree of doubt, directly related to the mismatch between the extraordinariness of any claim and the quality and quantity of the evidence provided to support it. Or, in slightly fewer words, scientific scepticism is the process of withholding acceptance of any claim until or unless an appropriate level of evidence can be provided. On the scale between cynicism at one end and gullibility at the other, scepticism is the healthy middle point. Let's look at a few more examples to illustrate the principle on which Bayes' theorem builds before we actually dig deeper into the theorem itself. Bayes' theorem is not just applicable to scientific research, but is also used throughout law, history, economics and many other similar subjects. Let me give you an example which often crops up in criminal cases and which regularly confuses lawyers, judges and juries. This illustrates a concept called dependent probability. Let's say you're on a jury and you're listening to the sad tale of a murder case. At the crime scene the police found some hair which came from the attacker and they had it DNA sampled. The DNA matched a criminal already on the police database and they brought him in on suspicion of murder. He's currently being accused of the offence despite the fact that he pleads his innocence. The prosecution attorney proudly proclaims that the DNA matching technique is staggeringly accurate. In fact, he says that the chance of an innocent man matching the DNA of the attacker using this technique is about one in a million. The prosecution rests its case. But fortunately, the defence attorney has a very good understanding of probability, so he begins his defence. Firstly, he points out that in a country of 60 million people, such as Britain, that means that there are therefore going to be roughly 60 people who will match the attacker's DNA on this test, and all but one of them is going to be innocent. So, given that you have one person who's matched the DNA, the best you can do, in the absence of any other evidence, is to say that there's roughly a 1 in 60 chance that the accused is guilty. And that's assuming that the hair found at the crime scene is even related to the murder. And it's assuming the attack was British. Once you add in the rest of the world, of course, those numbers go even more unlikely. Let's look at another example from medicine. Let's imagine that you're going to the hospital for a regular checkup. Maybe you've been feeling unwell and you ask to have some blood tests done. The doctor gives you some potentially very bad news. It turns out that there's a test that checks for a certain rare disease, which only affects 1 in 10,000 people. But the test is 99% accurate, and in your case, it's positive. This is the point where anyone without a background in probability might start to panic. But not the rational scientist, 
because she has a good understanding of Bayes' theorem and can easily work out something very reassuring. Let's put it this way. You've tested positive for a rare disease on a test that's 99% accurate. So one of two unlikely things must be true. Either you actually have this disease, which affects 1 in 10,000 people, so your chance is 1 in 10,000. Or, alternatively, you've been given a false positive result. That is, the test said you were a sufferer of this disease, but the test was wrong. Now, given the test is 99% accurate, the chance that it's wrong is 1%, or 1 in 100. Let's look at these numbers. Either the test is wrong, 1 in 100, or you have an incredibly rare disease, 1 in 10,000. But it's clear from this that it's 100 times more likely that the test is wrong than that you have this rare disease. So even though you got a positive result, it's still very unlikely that you're actually suffering from this rare disease. Right, now that we have a few examples for how base theorem or something like it might help us out, let's look in more detail about what it means to gather evidence in support of a scientific theory. Let's look at a toy example for how the process of gathering evidence might work, and the kinds of things that we'd like to be able to do. I'm going to show you how we can use the principle of Bayes' theorem to investigate the workings of the universe by examining a theory that I've just dreamt up, which I'll call organic gravity. Organic gravity is my own pet theory that I'm interested in testing, and it's a competitor to the Newtonian theory of gravity that we all know all too well. Organic gravity is slightly different because it says that gravity only affects organic objects. For example, when an apple falls off a tree, it's affected by gravity because it's an organic object. However, organic gravity says that non-organic objects, such as rocks and minerals, are not affected by gravity at all. So I'm guessing that you already have some prior impression of whether or not organic gravity may be true, but let's just work through this from square one. Let's start off with the assumption that there are only these two possible models of gravity, Newtonian gravity and organic gravity, and that one or other of these must therefore be correct and the other is false. Let's also say that we don't have any prior preference of which one is actually correct. In short, let's go through the entire process of science that was probably implicitly coded into your initial reactions to my claim, but let's look at how we might test this claim more empirically. To start with, let's say the supporter of organic gravity suggests a test that I mentioned earlier, that we drop an apple from a tree and check whether or not it falls. So we line everything up carefully, we set up our slow motion camera, our remotely activated servos for dropping the apple, and our pressure pads to measure its impact. We stand back, don our safety glasses and helmets, and press the magic button. Lo and behold, the apple drops exactly as predicted by the theory of organic gravity. The supporter of organic gravity then claims that we have powerfully vindicated this theory. But here's the point of this first test. It's not actually telling us very much at all. Sure, it could have disproved organic gravity, say if the apple didn't fall as expected, but in general this test has no way of distinguishing between organic gravity and its competitor, Newtonian gravity, because they both make exactly the same predictions in this case. That is to say, regardless of which theory is correct, we fully expect the apple to fall. So it falls, and we've learnt nothing. However, as good scientists, we look for another test that will help us to distinguish between the two competing theories. We set up the experiment exactly as before, but this time we use a stone instead of an apple. This time the two theories predict different outcomes. Newtonian gravity predicts that the stone will drop just like the apple did, whereas organic gravity predicts that it will not drop. So we carry out the test and the stone drops well, like a stone. The result is entirely in opposition to the theory of organic gravity, so that theory is defeated and Newton rules supreme once more. No doubt I could probably come up with some excuse for why organic gravity didn't quite predict the result that was observed, but any reasonable scientist would discard organic gravity at this point. Let's look at this case in more detail, and in particular let's examine more closely what the two tests have given us in this experiment. Test 1, dropping the apple. This didn't help us at all, because although it supported the organic gravity theory, it also supported Newtonian gravity equally. That is, it was a useless test, because it didn't distinguish between the two different potential models. However, if you cast your mind back to the previous lecture, I said that one important property of a scientific theory was that it should be falsifiable. That is to say, it must be possible to come up with an experiment that could, at least in principle, falsify a theory entirely, at least to within a reasonable level of doubt. Well, that's definitely the case here. After all, if the apple had failed to drop, then it would have disproved organic gravity. But that didn't happen in practice. So, given that our first test didn't accomplish this feat, we instead propose a second test. In the second test, we dropped a stone instead of an apple. Now, the special aspect of this test is that the two theories disagree on what should happen when we let go of the stone. Organic gravity says it should hover in mid-air, whereas Newtonian gravity says that it should fall in the same way that the apple did. 
So this is a far more useful test, and it results in demolishing the organic gravity theory and supporting Newtonian gravity. It doesn't prove it, of course, it merely supports it, and there's an important difference. In this example there are two theories, so if we disprove one, we prove the other by default. But in general there's an infinity of potential theories, and consequently, even though a test of Newtonian gravity is fully in agreement with what the theory says should happen, that doesn't mean that the theory is then proved correct. It just means that we have a little bit more evidence to support it. It could always still be the case that it only works on the objects that we've tried so far, but it will stop working as soon as we test it on something different, say. So what do we do when we can't distinguish between two probabilities? What happens when we have to decide which of two models is the most plausible, but the evidence supports both of them equally? Well, the answer is simple. If you consider the example I gave you earlier for the Elvis impersonator. If you're walking down the street and you see a man who looks just like Elvis, the evidence supports equally the possibility that it's really Elvis or an off-duty impersonator. But what we do next is we bring in prior knowledge into the equation. That is, we rely on what we know already, ignoring this new evidence, and use that to see if it sways our opinion either way. And in the Elvis case, of course, the prior evidence includes the fact that he's dead, so that pretty much sways our opinion to the side of us having seen an impersonator. Let's look at another example, that of the rare disease I mentioned earlier. Here's where it's relevant. Imagine that you're going for a test for a rare disease and it shows a positive result. Like I said, one of two things has happened. Either you have a rare disease or the test has given a false positive. Now, both of these are probably fairly rare occurrences, but the only way to decide which of these is most likely is to look at the prior probabilities of each outcome. And we probably know both of these. We know the chance of you actually having the disease because we know how prevalent it is in the country statistically. And we know what the sensitivity of the test is because we've used it many times and we know how many times it's proved to be wrong. So by combining these values we can make an educated guess. That's all it really is. As to which of these unlikely situations is most likely to be the case. After all, if the disease affects one in a million people, say, but the test is 99% accurate, what we're essentially saying is that there's a one in a million chance that you actually have the disease, but a one in a hundred chance that the test was just wrong. So I wouldn't worry, because that makes you 10,000 times more likely to be healthy than to have the disease. In fact, even if you get three positive tests in a row, it's still fractionally more likely that you don't have the disease than you do. Which you may find surprising, but it's just math. While we're on the subject of math, let's start with some nomenclature that I ought to introduce, because it will greatly simplify what we're talking about here. Let's remember that what we're really considering is the probability that some hypothesis is true, given the evidence that we've seen. Once more, we're looking at the probability, or chance, that some hypothesis is true, say, the probability that organic gravity is true, or that we've just seen Elvis, given some new evidence, which has just arrived, that we would like to examine. In shorthand, we would write that claim in this way. The probability that a hypothesis H is true, given the evidence E. In this shorthand, the P basically stands for probability, so that's easy enough. And what it means is the probability of whatever is within those brackets. And the term inside the brackets is shorthand for our hypothesis is true given the evidence. The vertical bar in the middle there just means given all the stuff on the right hand side, which in this case is just E, the evidence that we've gathered. So this is the answer that we're trying to work out. How likely is it that our hypothesis is correct given the evidence that we've received? And it depends on two things. Firstly, what support does this new evidence give to our hypothesis? If you recall in the first experiment, the fact that the apple fell didn't really help our hypothesis at all because it didn't distinguish between either Newtonian or organic gravity. But when we ran the same test again with a stone, that gave strong support to Newtonian gravity and strongly opposed organic gravity. The second thing that this quantity depends on is the prior probability of each of our theories. Now, in practice, we may have no preference at all because we may not have collected any evidence in favour or against any of our candidate hypotheses yet. But in practice, this is rarely the case. We usually have at least a little bit of bias in one way or the other. And in the general case, with scientific theories, the fact that they have been repeatedly confirmed by multiple diverse experiments gives us good confidence that these theories are true. And claims that go against such established theories are going to start off on the back foot, as it were. That is to say, there is a low prior likelihood that they are true, whereas there is a very high prior likelihood that the established theory is true. So if I were to say that I thought that a brick might drop when I let go of it, that would coincide nicely with the extremely well-supported theory of gravity. So it would have a very high prior probability. But if I instead claim that the brick would float in mid-air and would never drop, then that would go against the theory of gravity, and hence would start out with a very low prior probability. What this essentially means is that if the theory we are testing has a strong prior probability, we probably won't require as much support from evidence to accept it as probably true. 
but if the proposed hypothesis has a very low prior probability, we would require a very large amount of supporting evidence to make it seem plausible. Which reminds me, it's time we put all this together and finally revealed the full form of Bayes' theorem in all its glory. And here it is, Bayes' theorem written out in shorthand. And before you panic at the obvious mathsiness of this slide, let's just explain in words what's going on here, because really this is just a shorthand way of writing what you've already learned. There's nothing surprising in this formula. It just so happens that it's a very useful shorthand because it's much quicker to write the theory in maths like this than it would be to explain it all in words. Besides, we should already be happy with at least the left hand of this equation. It's what we saw on the previous slide, that is, the probability that our hypothesis is correct given the new evidence that we've just gathered. Using that same notation then, let's look at the right hand side of the equals sign. This is the definition that we discussed in words on the last slide. Firstly, the support that the evidence gives to our theory. This is made up of two components, the probability that we obtain the evidence given that the theory is true, and the background probability of getting that evidence regardless of which theory is true. The final term here is the prior, that is the probability that the theory that we're testing is true based on all our previous knowledge but excluding this new evidence. If we have no preference then this will be the same for all hypotheses, but in general that isn't the case. Let's break these terms down a little bit further. So we've learned that the probability that a hypothesis is correct, given some evidence that we've collected, is related to two things. The support given by that evidence, and the prior probability of the hypothesis. Let's start by looking at the support in more detail. What do we mean when we're talking about evidential support? Well, using the first term on the right-hand side of the formula for Bayes' rule, let's see what it implies. Well, firstly we notice that it's made up of two terms, one divided by the other. Now the one on top is the probability of getting the evidence that we saw if our hypothesis were true, p of e given h. Clearly, if the evidence that we see is a very likely result of our hypothesis, then that makes the evidence strongly supportive of our hypothesis. Conversely, if the evidence goes strongly against what our hypothesis predicts, then this greatly reduces the support that the evidence gives to our hypothesis. On the bottom of this fraction we have the background probability of our evidence, p of e. What's this doing here? Well, there's an obvious reason for it, actually. Even if our theory predicts some evidence perfectly, that still doesn't provide strong support for that theory if that evidence is actually very common anyway. But if that evidence would be very rare, then the fact that we've seen it does provide strong support. To illustrate this, let's look at the usage of garlic for scaring away vampires. Now, I had some garlic with my lunch, and I don't see a single vampire anywhere near me at the moment, so I think that provides excellent support for my hypothesis. Or does it? The problem here is that the background probability of our evidence is either one or very close to it. That is to say, as far as we know, vampires don't exist, so we should absolutely expect not to see them. Even if they did exist, they don't come out in the sunlight, so I wouldn't expect to see them shortly after lunch anyway. And because of that, whether or not garlic scares away vampires, I wouldn't expect to see any vampires anyway, so the probability of our evidence given the hypothesis, or indeed any hypothesis, is also one. What does this all mean in terms of Bayes' equation? In this slide I've rewritten Bayes' theorem and I've replaced the hypothesis H with the hypothesis that garlic scares away vampires, indicated by the little garlic bulb. And what's the evidence we've gathered? Well, it's the observation that we don't see any vampires around after eating garlic. So I've used this beautifully crafted image of a vampire bat with a red cross through it. So let's plug in the numbers we've been looking at and see what it means. And this is actually quite easy. We decided that the probability of our evidence, namely that we saw no vampires, was 1. P of E is 1. That is to say, we're guaranteed to see no vampires regardless of whether or not the cure works, because they don't exist. Or at least they're extremely unlikely to exist. Strictly speaking, I could have chosen 0 0.9999999 or something very close to one here, but that's just splitting hairs. On top of this equation, what's the probability that we would see no vampires if our hypothesis is correct? That is to say, if garlic truly does scare them away, well that's a one as well. If our hypothesis is true, then we definitely wouldn't see any vampires. So in the place of the support, p e of h over p of e, we have 1 divided by 1, which is 1. So what are we left with? Well, when you multiply something by 1, it's unchanged. So what we actually have here is that the probability of our hypothesis being true, given our evidence, is exactly equal to the prior probability of our hypothesis being true before we collected the evidence. That is to say, the evidence has achieved precisely nothing whatsoever. In fact, this will always be true whenever the top and bottom of that fraction are the same. That is, whenever the chance of our hypothesis giving the observed evidence is exactly the background level that we would expect by chance, regardless of whether or not our hypothesis is true.
In this case, there's no way we can distinguish a real confirmation of our hypothesis from chance, so we've learnt nothing. Let's look a bit more closely at priors, because they're a huge part of our understanding of Bayes' theorem, and we sort of got a definition from the previous slide. That is, I said that for the case when the evidence doesn't distinguish at all, we end up with the probability of our hypothesis being true, given the new evidence being exactly the prior. So when the evidence doesn't have any effect, we get our prior back unaltered. The prior is actually the probability that our hypothesis is correct before we even look at the evidence. So I suppose it's all in the name. It's the probability that our hypothesis is correct prior to any experiments we might carry out to attempt to test it. Now, before we've begun to look at our hypothesis at all, we have no preference for it or against it, but we do have to take into account all the other hypotheses that might exist. In our simplistic example earlier with vampires, there really were only two possibilities, that garlic scares away vampires or it doesn't. If we have no preference towards either of these two hypotheses whatsoever, then we have a totally flat prior. That is to say, the prior for both of them is equal, it's 50-50, so the priors are both 0.5 or a half. If we had, say, 10 potential hypotheses to explain something and we had no preference between them, then the priors would also all be the same, but this time there would be 1 in 10, that is, a tenth, or 0.1. In a more practical and plausible scenario, we usually do have a strong tendency to believe one or other side of the debate. For example, when I mentioned the story of spotting someone who looks like Elvis walking down the street, and I investigated whether or not that gives us the confidence to proclaim that Elvis is alive. In this case, our prior is massively skewed. All we know of the last 30 plus years tells us that Elvis is dead. Even if he were alive, he would be extremely old by now and not the lively young singer who wowed audiences in the 50s and 60s. So the prior for the hypothesis that Elvis is alive is very, very low indeed. As close to zero as makes no difference. What does this mean? Well, I said it before, I'll say it again. Carl Sagan was right when he wrote that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. In order for us to seriously entertain the possibility that Elvis is alive today, say, or any other spurious claim like alien visitations or energy healing, we would require evidential support of such a staggeringly huge degree that, when multiplied by a tiny prior probability, would still give a value that was appreciably likely. That is to say, tens of percent, for example. So if our prior is one in a billion, we would require support of roughly a factor of a few hundred million to start taking this claim seriously. And what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that we would expect to see evidence that is fairly likely should our hypothesis be true, but is extraordinarily unlikely to the scale of one in a few hundred million should our hypothesis be false. If you understood that last paragraph, then congratulations, you understand the basis for all of scientific scepticism. If you didn't understand it, then don't worry, there's a few slides left and you can listen to this lecture as many times as you like. So, for one last demonstration, let's go right back to the example I introduced earlier called organic gravity. If you remember, we had two competing theories. Newtonian gravity is the theory that we all know and love, and organic gravity was an ill-fated contender that suggested that maybe gravity only worked on organic objects like fruit, vegetables and animals. We tested these two theories with two tests. Let's look at them in numbers. And we can do the first test very easily because we've already worked out that dropping an apple gives us no distinction between the two models whatsoever. So the results after that test are still 50-50. We have no preference for one model or the other. But the second test is different, because when we drop a stone, it falls, which is against the organic gravity theory. Let's look at how that affects the likelihood for Newtonian gravity first. The probability that a stone will fall on Newtonian gravity is 1, and we've already said that the two theories are so far equally likely, so the prior is a half. But what is the probability that a stone will fall, the background probability? Well, to work this out, we have to take into account all possibilities. In this case, as it happens, it's fairly easy. We know that we view Newtonian and organic gravity to be equally likely, and in Newtonian gravity the stone falls, whereas in organic gravity it does not. That means there's a 50-50 chance that the stone will fall, i.e. a probability of 0.5. When we work through those numbers, we get that the probability that Newtonian gravity is correct, given the falling stone, is equal to 1, or certain. We can also look at the organic gravity theory and see where it collapses. The prior is 0.5, as we've already said and the background level for the evidence is also 0.5, we work that out above. But what's the probability that a stone will fall if organic gravity is correct? Well, it's zero. So when we work out the answer here, we see that the probability that organic gravity is correct, given that a stone has been observed to fall, is also zero. At this point, you're probably thinking that something's gone wrong, because I just said that a simple bit of evidence has proved a scientific theory to absolute 100% certainty, 
despite the fact that I spent a long time earlier saying how that wasn't really possible in the real world. And that's the caveat here. What we've been looking at so far have been really simple toy examples that aren't completely realistic. And the reason why we've been able to get such a solid result so easily is that I've made a few assumptions. But there really aren't all that many. Here's a list of the main ones I've made that might make this process different in the real world. Firstly, I've assumed completeness. That is, I've assumed that there are only two possibilities, and I know them both. Though in reality, there may be many different possible explanations, and they're not often entirely understood. In our example, we assume that the only two possibilities were Newtonian gravity and organic gravity, but there could be many other potential models that need to be tested. For example, many nearly Newtonian models where the exact force strength is slightly different, or varies slightly differently with distance. Or the good old Newtonian gravity that doesn't apply to giraffes on the planet Mars. There are clearly an infinite number of alternatives here, so we need to do something clever to set up our equations. For a start, how can we possibly work out the prior probability of observing our evidence if we aren't even aware of all the possible models and their priors? Well, one way might be to deal with statistics. For example, if we've made a million observations of a property and it matches our experimental results half the time, then we could infer that the probability of that evidence should be about 0.5. And to do that, we don't need to know anything about the universe of potential models. We are also assuming that our experiment was accurate, and that the evidence that we've gathered is exactly what happened. In this case, it's fairly obvious whether or not an item falls or floats, but you can imagine a case where you're measuring a fairly complex quality and it seems to behave as expected, but the error bars are so large that you can't be sure. We can deal with this, of course, by adding this understanding of our methods into the probability of our evidence given the hypothesis. For example, if I'm attempting to measure the speed of a bullet fired from a rifle, I might reasonably expect to have some difficulty getting the measurement exactly right if all I have to time them is a stopwatch, say. So if my hypothesis is that two different bullet types fly at slightly different speeds, then I could reasonably expect, at least some of the time, to get the measurement wrong by enough of a margin that I measure the slower bullet as travelling faster. So by understanding the sort of accuracy that I'm able to get in my measurements, I can easily estimate what the chance is of observing any particular measure given the hypothesis I'm testing. And in this case, the chance that I measure bullet A as travelling faster than bullet B, despite the fact that B is actually faster than A, is going to be non-zero. That is, there's a chance that I might measure incorrectly. And Bayes' theorem can handle this, provided that we're mature enough to test our methods of measuring and honestly assess their accuracy. And finally, we're assuming that we actually understand our models. That is, we're assuming that we can easily make the estimate of the probability of observing our evidence given a particular hypothesis. And this is often a very easy step, but sometimes it isn't. Particularly in medical applications, it's often very difficult to predict, for example, the effect that a certain drug might have on a subject, because there are so many potential complicating factors. This can often lead to incorrect diagnoses. For example, if a patient is given a certain drug to treat a medical complaint, and the drug makes her worse, a doctor might conclude that the patient didn't have the disease that they thought she had. However, it might just be that the patient is allergic to the drug prescribed, for example, but that the original diagnosis was otherwise correct. So we need to understand the hypothesis that we're testing and all its potential complications. Often this is very difficult, but that's what the process of the scientific method has been designed to solve. So we finally reached the end of this lecture. Let's just briefly summarise what we've learned. And if you're still unclear on some of these points, feel free to go back and re-watch this lecture, and I hope it will begin to make sense. This might seem like a bit of esoteric mathematics at first glance, but it's actually really important, and once you understand how Bayes' theorem works, the rest of the scientific process is really about gathering the various numbers to plug into this formula, and doing so as accurately as possible. In summary, Bayes' theorem allows us to update hypotheses in response to evidence. It gives us a method to understand how our picture of the world should change whenever we learn something new. It does this by evaluating how much support any new evidence gives to the hypothesis in question. That is, now that we know this evidence, how well aligned is it with what we expected from this hypothesis? And how surprising would it be to obtain this same evidence if our hypothesis were false? The better aligned the evidence is with the predictions of our hypothesis, and the more surprising it will be to get the evidence we see under any other different hypothesis, then the more support the evidence gives for our hypothesis. And that, in a nutshell, is Bayes' theorem. So I've spoken a lot in this lecture about the skeleton of logic around which science is built. Let's begin looking at more practical aspects. How does the scientific method actually work? How do scientists go about putting Bayes' theorem into practice? And how does science correct its own mistakes? The next lecture in this series will answer those questions.
In the meantime, I'll put the notes for this lecture up on my blog at frame.net, where you can also follow the other many and varied projects that I'm working on. And you can leave your comments and questions. In particular, if there's an aspect of science that you don't understand, then drop me a note and I'll see if I can produce a presentation on that very subject. Thanks very much for listening and I'll see you next time.